Thank you so much for joining the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church's online worship service. I just want to take a moment and give you some information to help you to connect with our ministry. On Monday nights, we have a Bible study that begins at 7 p.m. On Thursday night, our online Bible study begins at 7.30 p.m. Also, during the week, we send out two emails, one on Tuesday, where we look back at the, uh, Sunday's worship service, and the other is on Friday, where we look forward to the weekend service. You can subscribe to the email, which is given to our members and friends, by following the prompts on the screen. You can go to www.new4hopejc.com backslash email. Thank you so much for being a part of the New Hope family. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to New Hope Online, where Dr. Alonzo Perry Sr. is our pastor. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving. Before we get started, I invite you to share this broadcast. There is someone in your circle that needs to be encouraged, someone who needs to hear from heaven. Help ensure that the gospel is spread by sharing this broadcast and starting watch parties on your page. To those celebrating a birthday this week, may the Lord bless you and fill your birthday with joy and happiness. And on behalf of the church, we say happy birthday to you. Here are a few announcements about events and initiatives happening here at the church. The Missionary Circle is sponsoring the annual Angel Tree Toy Drive. Use the link below to select a, a child or donate to support. Also, this Tuesday is Giving Tuesday. As you think of organizations to support, please consider giving to New Hope's Food Pantry as we work to feed those in need. Be on the lookout for our annual Christmas program. This year it's titled Home for Christmas. You don't wanna miss it on our social media platforms. And lastly, we will host watch night service online. A vital part to the service is the power of the testimony. And despite the rough time that we've had this year, God has still been good to us. Take a moment to record a three minute video and share it using the link below. If you have questions or need assistance, please contact us and we will help you. Let's now enter this time of worship with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the chance to gather, to sing praises to you, to pray as a body united in Christ and to receive a word from you. Open our hearts and minds to receive encouragement, comfort, and correction that will make us into a better image and likeness of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and also verses 28 and 29. 
I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. And now let us begin. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Blessed is the word of God for the people of God. We give it to you. 
Now is the time in our service where we go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you today. And Lord, you deserve our honor and our praise. And Lord, we praise you today because you are the one and only true God, that you are all powerful, all knowing, and you're everywhere at the same time. Lord, we reverence your name this morning because your name is above all names. And so Lord, because of that, we thank you. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for our food. Uh, we thank you for our clothes on our back. Lord, we just thank you for another day, a day that we have never seen before with a, another chance and an opportunity to praise you and to serve you and your people. And Lord, we ask you this morning to forgive us of our sins, forgive us of those times that we have fallen short, that you have extended your grace and mercy to us, even though we don't deserve it. Lord, we don't deserve anything you've given us, but it's because of the mercies that you give us fresh and new every single day that we love you and we adore you, God. And Lord, we just, we're here today just to ask you to watch over us and watch over our families during this time in this pandemic. Lord, right now we pray for all of those who have lost loved ones during this time. People who have sat at tables during this holiday and there were missing seats. God, we ask that you comfort and keep them because we know that it is hard. Even though a lot of us are in a, a, a point of celebration, there are those of us who are dealing with extreme loss. And not only just loss of loved ones, Lord, but also loss of jobs, of loss of income, of happiness, and they're filled with anxiety and grief. And so, Lord, right now, I ask that you touch each and every one of us to give us the peace that surpasses all understanding, that we know that you can and will give to those of us who believe in you. Lord, we pray today for families. We pray that you continue to strengthen them as they are shut in together, Lord, help them to rediscover their love for one another and to use this time of stillness as a time to be reacquainted with each other, realize how much they love each other and to unify as a family. At the same time, God, I pray for those who don't have that feeling right now, that they're troubled in the home because of all the stress of this world. God, I pray that you protect men and women and children as they're in their homes, not sure of what's going to come up tomorrow. But God, you promised us that you take care of the birds of the fields and the, the, the lilies in the field that you would take care of us. And so, Lord, we ask that you continue to take care of all of those who need taken care of right now. And God, that you would use us, your people, to be resources to help those who need help during this time. God, we pray for our communities. We pray that you keep our communities safe, that you keep us from harm and danger. God, that as communities that we will unify and help our fellow sisters and brothers. God, we pray for our schools that are in our community, that are in this place of remote and virtual learning. God, I pray that you give them new innovations, new ways to teach and reach out to our children. Lord, I pray that you give them the insight to serve our families, to, to help them with all the resources that they can. 
Lord, I pray for teachers that you reduce their anxiety and stress and give them the ease that we know that you can give them. For all our, our educational leaders, God, we pray that you give them your wisdom to make decisions that will best serve teachers and their staff. God, we pray for our local governments, that our local leaders will make decisions that will positively affect people and be according to your will and your way. And Lord, nationally, we pray for our government that's in place and government that is transitioning. God, that you guide their footsteps and guide their decision making and that you would guide them to make the best decisions for your people. And so, Lord, now we pray for churches everywhere. We pray for churches that call on your name. Lord, that you continue to encourage them and lift them up, to give them the motivation to continue to share your gospel despite these unprecedented times. And Lord, we pray for our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Alonzo Perry Sr. As he comes before your people to share the word that you've given to him, God, we pray that you give him clarity of speech, that you open his eyes to your, to your word, that he can give us your word in a plain way that we can apply it to our lives. Lord, we pray for every person who's connected with the New Hope Church, that you continue to bless and keep them and to keep them safe. And Lord, we pray overall for this service, that it will be what you would have it to be, that someone will watch us today and ask, what must I do to be saved? All of these blessings we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining the New Hope Missionary Baptist Church's online worship service. I just want to take a moment to thank you for your support of this ministry. I want you to know that your support is vital to the success of our ministry. If you want to give to the New Hope Church, you can text New Hope JC to 77977. Or if you use the Cash App, you can give a dollar sign New For Hope JC. If you like, you can go to our website and give there at newforhopejc.com backslash give. We want to thank you again so much for your support to this ministry. May God bless you and may heaven smile upon you.
Welcome to New Hope Missionary Baptist Church's online worship service, and we're so glad you could be with us today. Um, we want to thank our praise team for leading us in singing, and uh, we're just grateful to God for having to be in this uh, season of giving thanks. And we know it's a rough time that uh, folk are feeling, experience a lot of difficulty, but our prayer as always is that everything is well with you and your family at your home. I'm hoping and praying that you had a happy uh, Thanksgiving. And, uh, and today we're finishing up a series called The Worst Year Ever. And as we found out that there are a bunch of other years that uh, uh, are vying to make the claim for uh, the distinction of being the worst year ever, and for many, 2020 uh, is a year that will go down in history. It's historic in terms of uh, the number of things that we've had happen in terms of our economy, in terms of uh, we've seen social uh, uh, racial injustice on display. Uh, we've seen all sorts of uh, political turmoil. And then we have a pandemic that has uh, claimed the lives of over 250 thousand souls and uh, many of them have been our families and our friends and so uh, we have all of that uh, in front of us in this year 2020 but I wanted to end this series today and look at a passage of scripture that uh, it, it really kind of gives us a way of looking at adversity and looking at trouble and that is the book of Hebrews chapter number 12 verses 1 to 3 and verses 28 and 29 of Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from the NIV, which stands for the New International Version of the Bible. And here's what it says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. You know, I've thought about this uh, sermon today and I thought about uh, some times in my life when I felt frustration. And I wonder if any of you have ever felt frustrated. Have you ever been to the place where you wanted to give up, throw up your hands and just walk away? Uh, maybe you're in a relationship. Maybe you're in a marriage that isn't working. Maybe it's a job that just doesn't seem to be uh, working out. Maybe it's uh, financial. Maybe you're at a place where you are just ready to give up, check out and just leave. I want to talk to you today because I've been there. I've been to the places where I just felt downright frustrated and wanted to quit. One of those times, and, and, and uh, the text speaks to it, uh, but one of those times for me was uh, back in 1989. I was uh, candidating for a church in, in, in Harlem uh, up in Morningside Heights and uh, went there and uh, uh, I, my pastor then at the time, Reverend James Williams, was so gracious that one Sunday he allowed me to take the young adult choir of New Hope with me as I went there. And I was so excited about the prospect of pastoring and and teaching and leading the people of God. And uh, I went back and forth for about a month or so uh, preaching at this church and talking to the guy who had been the pastor, only to find out that uh, what he really wanted was just somebody to preach, not somebody to pastor. Wouldn't let me teach, wouldn't let me do some of the things, exercise my full gifts. I was frustrated. Matter of fact, at that point, I was kind of ready to, to throw in the towel. 
I think about a time when, uh, when my job, I worked for the uh, Department of Transportation and I was on loan to New Jersey Transit. Uh, and uh, one day I had, had a boss who had a kind of uh, the streak in him when he'd get upset, get, get, get angry, throw things and, and really, really go off the rails. One day he did that and I, I, I just got so frustrated, got so angry. I went into this office and I said, I quit. I was that frustrated. Uh, I hadn't thought about it a lot. And even today, I think about those choices. When you get frustrated, when you just really want to check out. So, so this, this writer of Hebrews, who most scholars agree that it's probably Paul because it's Pauline in style, uh, is written like Paul or somebody who's been around him a lot. But he talks about uh, in chapter 12, he says, therefore, and the therefore in chapter 12 really relates to what happens in chapter 11. Chapter 11 uh, is, is the chapter we talk about the hall of faith. So today I want to just make this point to you. I want to uh, use the analogy that Paul uses where he says our uh, Christian journey is like a race. And so I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters, stay in the race, stay in the race. And I want to give you today some keys to staying in the race. One thing I want you to remember, if you don't remember anything else from this message, I want you to remember, even in this year of 2020, you are not alone. That's right. The writer of Hebrews makes it clear. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that there are people who have gone on, who surround us, who remind us that they made it. And because they made it, you and I also can make it. Well, what do you mean? Well, if you look in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, where it talks about now faith is, You've heard that. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, for, you know, because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And then the writer of Hebrews goes on to give us all of the entrance into the hall of faith. He lists all of those folk who've gone on before us who are now permanently enshrined, not in the NBA Hall of Fame, not in the NFL Hall of Fame or the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, but in the Bible's Hall of Faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews. Now, let me tell you about some of these folk who made it in, who have been enshrined in the Hall of Faith. They're right there in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews. You want to know who some of them are? Well, let me help you with this. Because when you look at those folk who made it in, Noah, he got drunk. Abraham, he was a liar. Sarah, she laughed at the promise of God. Jacob, he was a cheater. Joseph, he was arrogant. Moses, was a murderer. Rahab was a prostitute. Samson broke his vow before God. David was a murderer and an adulterer. But yet, they're in the hall of faith. And they bid us to keep going, to keep pressing, because even though this may be the worst year ever, these witnesses cry out to us and tell us we need to stay in the race. Well, there are several things you need to do to stay in the race. First of all, you need to calculate. And by that, I really mean you need to be intentional. You need to uh, realize that the race that you're in, you're only in it because Jesus has called you to run the race. It's not like you and I are potential Olympians. It's not like we are the best in our class, the, 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 the best at what we do. 
No, it's that God looked out and he saw you and said, I want you to run on my team. Not because you're the fastest, not because you are the best, the most gifted or, 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 or the, the quickest person out there. It is because God has deemed you to be on his team. And you know what? Because he's called you on his team, he is giving you and I a race to run. Now, the wonderful thing about the race that you and I get to run is that we don't all get to run the same way. We don't all have the same abilities and talents, but understand this, we got to be intentional. This is a race of faith. It's a long distance race. It's not a sprint. I mean, yes, we come to Jesus, we get excited, but understand this race is not to the swift. It's not to the strong, but it's to the one who holds out till the end. Now, I've come to ask you a question. Have you been running, but trying, but you're wondering why is it so hard? Why, why do you get winded so quickly? Why are others running faster than you are? What's wrong? Well, the writer of Hebrews says the problem is that some of us run, but we're not intentional about our running. We're not calculated. We don't think about the race in front of us. The writer says that it is impossible for us to win and to achieve and be the people God wants us to be when we run and we have weights and hindrances that are holding us back. You watch Olympic runners, doesn't matter if they run in the, the 100 meter dash or they run in 5,000 meters. They all uh, wear as little clothing as they possibly can because they know carrying extra weight only slows them out, only hinders their ability to succeed in their event. So I want to raise this question to you. Could it be that perhaps you are not taking this race as serious as you should? Maybe you got in it thinking that it was only going to be a sprint. But now, a few weeks later, months, years, you're still running. And now we've got to we got to change the way we look at this race. So not only do we have to. Uh, calculate, be intentional. But the second thing we need to do is we need to focus and we're going to win this race. We need to focus. But I mean, what I mean by that is you can't run aimlessly. You know, the reality is, is that you are responsible for your race. Now, it would be nice if I could be responsible for your race or if you could be responsible for my race. But each of us are entrants in this race and we can only be responsible for the race that has been put before us. You know, some of us, we get in trouble because we start watching other people. And when you start watching other people, it gets really difficult. It can become frustrating when you're trying to run and folk are running around and they are passing you on the track of life and they seem to be passing you more often than you can get around the track. You know, when I was running in high school back in the day, I ran long distance. And uh, we, had, we had some unwritten rules for long distance runners. We ran around a track that went around our high school football field. It was one quarter of a mile meaning you had to go around that track four times to make a mile. And I would run the one mile and I'd run the two mile distance. I remember one day I had uh, uh, two track meets. I ran the half mile, the mile and the two mile event all in the same day. But one thing about uh, running uh, around the laps, all of us lined up and when the starter raised his pistol and fired and said, go, we all took off. 
Now, sometimes some of the athletes would be much faster than some of the runners. And what happens is that sometimes before we would finish the four laps or the eight laps, there would be people who were much faster out front and they would find themselves passing the other runners before they had completed the race. And the unwritten rule was whenever somebody came around you to pass you, they called that lapping you. You were supposed to move over and give them access to the inside lane. But you know what happens with a lot of us? We get so fixated on the person who seems to be moving faster than we are. So instead of running our race, we get upset, we get frustrated, we get envious of the person who may be lapping us, all the while forgetting the fact that each of us has our own race to run. Now, it'd be nice if you could run for me, but I won't do. At the end, each of us has got to stand before God for ourselves to give an account for how we ran our race. Hebrews chapter 13, verse five says it like this. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So some of us can't run the way we ought to because we are too busy trying to catch up with somebody else. We got our focus in the wrong lane. We got our eyes on the wrong prize. So the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse five, we've got to be content where God has placed us. You know, they have a colloquial say in the day, stay in your lane. Do whatever God called you to do and run the race that he has set before you. You know, this running metaphor that the writer Hebrews uses is an apt metaphor for us. Even in this year 2020, a lot of us could do well if we would learn that we're not alone, that we've got to, we've got to calculate and be intentional about our running, and we've got to be focused. We've got to put our mind on our objective. And another thing I want to tell you, if you really want to be successful and in this Christian race, you've got to train. The writer of Hebrews says that we've got to cast off or lay aside all the weight and sin that doth so easily beset us or cause us to trip up or entangle us. Now, I want you to understand this, that when you lay aside the weight and the sin, it's not a one-time deal. It's not a one-time event that we've got to learn that every time we suit up, we got to take off whatever it is that entangles us, whatever it is that causes us to lose our ability to run at our best. Now, what are the weights and sins? I don't know for you. You know, I found out that every weight is not necessarily a sin. Some of us are just too busy to run for Jesus, okay? And whatever it is, we've got to lay it aside so that we can run the race that has been set for us. So the writer says, lay aside the weight. And then he says, and the sin. So he distinguishes that there's a difference between weight and sin. Some of us are so encumbered worrying about stuff that we can't even get out and be good for the kingdom. You've got to lay it aside. So lay aside every weight and the sin that entangles us, that ensnares us, and keeps us from being and doing what God calls us to be. There's another element that that you and I are going to need, and that's training, okay? Serious runners understand that they got to discipline their bodies. You know, I've learned this the hard way that I can talk about losing weight, I can talk about getting in shape, but until I really decided to buckle down and to take some uh, accountability for for some of the things I was doing and wasn't doing, 
I was not being successful. I would sit there and get frustrated because my midsection kept growing because I, I didn't feel the way I ought to feel. And I kept saying, well, you know what? But I came to the realization like the writer of Hebrews is that if I'm going to be in this race and if I'm going to be serious about running and winning, I got to train. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell in, in his book, The Outliers, talks about uh, uh, deliberate practice. It says that to become successful in any enterprise, that the Olympic uh, trainer, the Olympic uh, athlete, that anybody wants to get to the top of whatever has to spend a minimum of 10,000 hours learning his or her craft. 10 thousand hours. Th think about that. If you worked eight hours a day, five days a week, that would be five years of nonstop work just to get to the top, to be at the pinnacle of where you want to be. A lot of us don't run well because we don't want to put in the work to train. We want it to come to us. We want it to happen but we don't want to put in the work. There's a saying that we have, you know, no pain, no gain. And so it is in the body of Christ. We've got to start reading our Bibles. We've got to start practicing the disciplines of having devotion, having prayer, giving, and we've got to learn how to have fellowship one with another. And when we can do those things, then we can begin to grow and to run this race. Well, the writer of Hebrews says that we run. But he says, you know, Paul has said this before, that everybody runs, but everybody doesn't win that there's only one laurel crown for one winner. But the race that God has, he says that whoever endures to the end is going to win. So you win simply by hanging in there. You win simply by showing up, coming to the track, putting in your time, doing your work, putting your reps in, you win. And so my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you that no matter what happens, you stay in the race. you got this great cloud of witnesses who are cheering for you, who are looking on and who will admit to you that they haven't been the best people, but they ran their race. And when you run your race, one day you'll be able to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to share with you a story that I, I came across the other day. The setting was uh, October 20th, 1968. It was in Mexico City. Uh, and there in Mexico City, uh, there was an Olympic runner. And this runner's name was uh, John Stephen Awari. And Awari was uh, representing the nation of Tanzania. And there he was um, running about an hour earlier. Um, Mama Waldi of Ethiopia had already won the marathon, but he had been entered into the marathon. And here he was unable uh, to place with the, with the winners. And so an hour later, after Mama Waldi had won the marathon, after the event was over, there was still about 7,000 people in the stadium. They were waiting for the final entry in the marathon to finish the race. Suddenly, there were sirens that started, started blaring. And, and folks started uh standing up, up looking to see what was happening and they looked and approaching the olympic stadium was one lone runner he was bloodied he was limping he could barely run but as he got to the track 
at the Olympic Stadium and began to round the state, the track. Those seven thousand or so folk in the store in the stadium, they stood on their feet. They started cheering wildly. They started applauding loudly. They were excited because this runner, he was finishing. Finally, he crossed the finish line. They brought him a flag of his native country, Tanzania. And a, a reporter went up to him while he was out of breath, while he was struggling to regain his composure. A reporter went to him and thrust the microphone in his face and asked him the question, why did you do it? Why didn't you give up? Why, why did you go at, and put your body through all of this? Why you're limping, you're bandaged, you're bloodied. Why? He had taken a terrible spill. He had fallen during the race. And the reporter wanted to know, why did he do it? Gasping for breath, he turned to that reporter and said to the reporter, I did it because my country did not send me 7,000 miles to Mexico City just to start this race. They sent me to finish. And I want to share with you that the race you're in, the race that God has entered you in, he did not enter you in this race just for you to run, to start, to have a good send off. But he put you in the race to win. He put you in this race so that you could finish. So I want to share with you, don't you give up heart. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare step back. I know you may be frustrated. I know you may be feeling like the weight of the world is on your shoulder. But the God who entered you into this race says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always. That's the promise you have. That's the promise I have. And even during this worst year ever, the promise is, I'm going to be with you. We'll get through this. We'll be able to look back, but stay focused. Be intentional. Be calculating. Focus, train, stay in the race. And don't you forget for one moment, you're not alone. You're not in this by yourself. So my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you wherever you are. I know you may be feeling dejected. I know you may be feeling all sorts of ways and you're wondering where's God in all of this equation. God is where he's always been. He still sits on the throne of, uh, of heaven. He still sits on the circle of earth. He still knows everything there is to know about you. And he loves you with a love that is so great. And he stands with arms wide open. And all he asks of you is you to come to me. And if you come to him, he'll enter you into the race of life. But don't you get sidetracked looking at other people. You just run the race he gave you to run. So maybe you're here in this past seven, eight months have just turned your life upside down. Maybe you wanted to quit a time or two. Maybe you really understand what the writer Hebrews was talking about. But therefore, since we are compassed about, we are surrounded with this great cloud of witnesses. Let us run. And the reason why you and I want to run is because we have an unshakable, we have an unshakable reward. That's what he promised, that your reward is already waiting for you. All you got to do is finish. All you got to do is remain faithful and you will receive an unshakable 
reward. I can't wait, can you? So before we go, would you bow your hands with me in a word of prayer? Lord, we're going to say thank you for this time that we had to share together. Thank you for watching over us, for keeping us. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be with family and friends. And this Thanksgiving season has been like no other. Many of us have had empty seats at our tables. We've had longing as we pine and as we long for those who've already gone. Some of us have been frustrated and wondering, God, what should we do next? But we thank you for the right of Hebrews who tells us that we ought to stay in this race, that our reward is unshakable, that all we have to do is continue to run the race that's been set before us. Yeah, there are going to be some obstacles. Yes, Lord, there are going to be some ups and downs. But I'm praying, God, that you would endure us and do each of us with more vigor, a more design, a greater determination to hang on in there. I pray for families who are especially bereaved now, who lost loved ones. I pray for that person who has questions and wondering where do you fit in all of this? I pray for that person who had lost a job and wondered how they're going to make ends meet, wondered how they're going to pay the rent, how they're going to put food on the table. But God, we know that you are a way maker. I know you as a healer. I know you personally as a deliverer. And I'm praying that you would stand up in, in, in the lives of those who listen today. Bless us now. We'll be blessed. Keep us and we shall be kept. We ask all of these blessings. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I want you to continue to be faithful because the promise is that if you and I are faithful, even unto death, we'll get the crown of life. God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. And may God give you his peace.